How many moons does Jupiter have? If you said four, you might be Galileo. If you said 69, you were right. Until the announcement this morning by the International Astronomical Union of the discovery of an additional 10 moons about the gas giant planet. Bringing the currently known total to 79. That's a lot of moons. A research team from the Carnegie Institution for Science, the University of Hawaii and Northern Arizona University was looking in 2017 for very distant objects in our solar system, well beyond Pluto. Jupiter happened to be in the same field of view, so they also looked for any as yet unknown moons. They found 12, two of which were announced last year. Confirmation of the moons required multiple observations, and those data enabled a calculation of the moon's orbits. Nine of the dozen moons are well away from Jupiter and have retrograde orbits, meaning they go around the planet in what we'd think of as the wrong direction. They take about two Earth years to complete their circuits. Two new moons are closer in, go the right way, and take about an Earth year for one orbit. Those 11 moons are probably remnants of larger bodies that got broken up in collisions. The remaining moon is less than a kilometer across, further out than the two conventional moons and has a 1.5-year orbit, and the orbit is inclined. That tilt has the weird little moon crossing the paths of those outer retrograde moons. Which means an increased likelihood of a big smash up one day. Depending on what survives from any such collision, Jupiter may then have even more moons or a couple fewer. How many moons does Jupiter have? If you said four, you might be Galileo. If you said 69, you were right. Until the announcement this morning by the International Astronomical Union of the discovery of an additional 10 moons about the gas giant planet. Bringing the currently known total to 79. That's a lot of moons. A research team from the Carnegie Institution for Science, the University of Hawaii and Northern Arizona University was looking in 2017 for very distant objects in our solar system, well beyond Pluto. Jupiter happened to be in the same field of view, so they also looked for any as yet unknown moons. They found 12, two of which were announced last year. Confirmation of the moons required multiple observations, and those data enabled a calculation of the moon's orbits. Nine of the dozen moons are well away from Jupiter and have retrograde orbits, meaning they go around the planet in what we'd think of as the wrong direction. They take about two Earth years to complete their circuits. Two new moons are closer in, go the right way, and take about an Earth year for one orbit. Those 11 moons are probably remnants of larger bodies that got broken up in collisions. The remaining moon is less than a kilometer across, further out than the two conventional moons and has a 1.5-year orbit, and the orbit is inclined. That tilt has the weird little moon crossing the paths of those outer retrograde moons. Which means an increased likelihood of a big smash up one day. Depending on what survives from any such collision, Jupiter may then have even more moons or a couple fewer. Let us now shift our attention to the second query. Maybe poverty's psychological effects influence economic decision-making, making it difficult to get out of it. And there are two ways in which this may occur. The first is that the stress of poverty may have a modest impact on economic decisions. Stress has been shown to make people more impatient than they are when they're not stressed, according to new research. If you want to make long-term decisions and investments in areas like health care and education, this is not a good thing. If you're poor, you're likely to be impatient because of the stress that comes with it. Impatience isn't going to help you get out of poverty, either. The psychological effects of poverty can also have a negative impact on poverty. Moreover, you run the risk of being rendered completely helpless. So it's difficult for people to stay working when persistent stress escalates into full-blown clinical depression. As a result, you doubt the effectiveness of your efforts.
In your mind, you know that no amount of data on educational returns can change your mind. You're struggling to get out of bed in the morning, let alone work, and your financial situation is dire. Even if you're affluent, this is still a terrible situation. Not only that, but the safety net isn't as wide. As a result, poverty is fueling a depression epidemic that is going unnoticed. Not only does this pose a threat to our mental health, but it may have negative effects on our financial situation as well. Let us now shift our attention to the second query. Maybe poverty psychological effects influence economic decision making, making it difficult to get out of it. And there are two ways in which this may occur. The first is that the stress of poverty may have a modest impact on economic decisions. Stress has been shown to make people more impatient than they are when they're not stressed, according to new research. If you want to make long-term decisions and investments in areas like health care and education, this is not a good thing. If you're poor, you're likely to be impatient because of the stress that comes with it. Impatience isn't going to help you get out of poverty, either. The psychological effects of poverty can also have a negative impact on poverty. Moreover, you run the risk of being rendered completely helpless. So it's difficult for people to stay working when persistent stress escalates into full-blown clinical depression. As a result, you doubt the effectiveness of your efforts. In your mind, you know that no amount of data on educational returns can change your mind. You're struggling to get out of bed in the morning, let alone work, and your financial situation is dire. Even if you're affluent, this is still a terrible situation. Not only that, but the safety net isn't as wide. As a result, poverty is fueling a depression epidemic that is going unnoticed. Not only does this pose a threat to our mental health, but it may have negative effects on our financial situation as well. Good morning to my respected teachers and my dear friends, I would like to give speech on the topic of global warming today. Global warming is mainly caused by the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Some of the greenhouse gases are CO2, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide and ozone. When these gases get collected to the lower environment, it makes a cover which easily allows all the hot radiations of the sun to the Earth however restrict its escape back to space. This process is called the greenhouse effect. Such gases in the atmosphere trap hot radiations and keep the Earth warm by increasing temperature. The level of greenhouse gases also raises because of human activities such as burning trees, burning fissile fuels, electric lights, use of refrigerator, microwave, air conditioner, and other electric machines. Such a process releases a high percentage of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere causing the Earth temperature to rise. The rise in heat causes more water from the Earth to evaporate into the atmosphere. Water vapor again absorbs more heat and makes Earth atmosphere warmer. Global warming has changed natural processes, rainfall patterns, length of seasons, the rise of sea level, ecology balance and many more. It is a powerful demon affecting our lives to a great extent so it needs to be solved on an urgent basis by the effort of all of us.
Good morning to my respected teachers and my dear friends. I would like to give speech on the topic of global warming today. Global warming is mainly caused by the increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. Some of the greenhouse gases are CO2, water vapor, methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone. When these gases get collected to the lower environment, it makes a cover which easily allows all the hot radiations of the sun to the Earth, however, restrict its escape back to space. This process is called the greenhouse effect. Such gases in the atmosphere trap hot radiations and keep the Earth warm by increasing temperature. The level of greenhouse gases also raises because of human activities such as burning trees, burning fissile fuels, electric lights, use of refrigerator, microwave, air conditioner, and other electric machines. Such a process releases a high percentage of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, causing the Earth temperature to rise. The rise in heat causes more water from the Earth to evaporate into the atmosphere. Water vapor again absorbs more heat and makes Earth atmosphere warmer. Global warming has changed natural processes, rainfall patterns, length of seasons, the rise of sea level, ecology balance, and many more. It is a powerful demon affecting our lives to a great extent, so it needs to be solved on an urgent basis by the effort of all of us. Influenced by internal and external variables, human conduct is determinate. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. There are two types of influences on determinant, internal variables relating to the individual and external elements pertaining to the environment. As far as the environment is concerned, temperature and air pressure are examples of what individuals believe and how they think about them individually under personal conditions. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on one's determinants. A sample response is the subject of this talk is the factors that influence human conduct. Both internal and external variables have an impact on it. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. As a general rule, human elements are believed to be internal, whereas environmental influences are considered external. Temperature, air pressure, and what others think about them are examples of environmental elements, whereas personal aspects include what individuals believe and how they think about it. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on human behavior. Influenced by internal and external variables, human conduct is determinate. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. There are two types of influences on determinant, internal variables relating to the individual and external elements pertaining to the environment. As far as the environment is concerned, temperature and air pressure are examples of what individuals believe and how they think about them individually under personal conditions. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on one's determinants. A sample response is, the subject of this talk is the factors that influence human conduct. Both internal and external variables have an impact on it. He added that psychologists are interested in understanding human behavior towards the end of the talk. As a general rule, human elements are believed to be internal, whereas environmental influences are considered external. Temperature, air pressure, and what others think about them are examples of environmental elements, whereas personal aspects include what individuals believe and how they think about it. To summarize, both the individual and the surrounding environment have an impact on human behavior. Tomorrow is April 20th, often known as 4 20ths. It's also known as a high holiday. Because 4 20ths is marijuana day for a lot of folks. And starting lighting up at 4.20 p.m. on 4.20ths has become something of a habit for them, prompting a couple of Canadian academics to ask if there was any indication of an increase in road deaths tied to the date. 
They gained access to the Fatality Analysis Reporting System of the United States National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which keeps track of all public road incidents in which at least one person died. They looked at the figures from 4.20 p.m. until midnight on April 20. Between 1992 and 2016, they also looked at road mortality from incidents on the same day a week before and one week later during the same hours. As a consequence, there was a 12% increase in traffic-related deaths on 4.20 after 4.20 p.m. compared to the control dates. And the figure for drivers aged 20 and younger was substantially higher, with some states reporting a 30% increase. The study was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Of course, this study does not establish that impaired driving as a result of marijuana usage contributed to the increased fatality rate. It's possible, for example, that drivers collided while attempting to light up. Scientific American has long advocated for decriminalization and making it easier for academics to examine marijuana's medical effects. However, we still don't recommend driving while inebriated, so if you're going to toke, prevent those pistons from stroking. In the engine, there are pistons. Tomorrow is April 20th, often known as 420ths. It's also known as a high holiday. Because 420ths is marijuana day for a lot of folks. And starting lighting up at 4.20pm on 420ths has become something of a habit for them, prompting a couple of Canadian academics to ask if there was any indication of an increase in road deaths tied to the date. They gained access to the Fatality Analysis Reporting System of the United States National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which keeps track of all public road incidents in which at least one person died. They looked at the figures from 4.20 p.m. until midnight on April 20. Between 1992 and 2016, they also looked at road mortality from incidents on the same day a week before and one week later during the same hours. As a consequence, there was a 12% increase in traffic-related deaths on 4.20 after 4.20 p.m. compared to the control dates. And the figure for drivers aged 20 and younger was substantially higher, with some states reporting a 30% increase. The study was published in JAMA Internal Medicine. Of course, this study does not establish that impaired driving as a result of marijuana usage contributed to the increased fatality rate. It's possible, for example, that drivers collided while attempting to light up. Scientific American has long advocated for decriminalization and making it easier for academics to examine marijuana's medical effects. However, we still don't recommend driving while inebriated, so if you're going to toke, prevent those pistons from stroking. In the engine, there are pistons. The agony of a burnt tongue or a wounded cheek can be excruciating. However, in comparison to other injuries, the wound heals very rapidly. Because a recent study demonstrates that proteins called transcription factors, which regulate all those healing elements, are present at higher quantities in oral tissue, all the factors needed to mend a wound are ready to spring into action. Consider the regulating proteins to be the stage directors, and the healing factors to be the on-stage performers. They're ready to go, standing on the sidelines in the oral epithelia, so the director tells them to go ahead and then they'll be right on stage. Senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health, Maria Marasso. She claims this isn't the case with normal skin tissue. They are capable of performing on stage. But they're nowhere near ready, so you'll have to go through the process of bringing them on stage before proceeding with the function. This slows down the healing process. It may be difficult to complete the play on time and in accordance with the script. The research was published in Science Translational Medicine. Marasso and her colleagues also put this theory to the test by genetically engineering mice to have more of those factors, known as directors, in their regular skin tissue, and they found that those mice healed skin wounds substantially quicker than control mice. However, we are unable to genetically modify humans.
Instead, Marasso suggests that if we can learn more about who the healing actors are, we might be able to develop more focused strategies to send those people on stage, to produce a better performance for patients. The agony of a burnt tongue or a wounded cheek can be excruciating. However, in comparison to other injuries, the wound heals very rapidly. Because a recent study demonstrates that proteins called transcription factors, which regulate all those healing elements, are present at higher quantities in oral tissue, all the factors needed to mend a wound are ready to spring into action. Consider the regulating proteins to be the stage directors, and the healing factors to be the on-stage performers. They're ready to go, standing on the sidelines in the oral epithelia, so the director tells them to go ahead and then they'll be right on stage. Senior investigator at the National Institutes of Health, Maria Marasso. She claims this isn't the case with normal skin tissue. They are capable of performing on stage. But they're nowhere near ready, so you'll have to go through the process of bringing them on stage before proceeding with the function. This slows down the healing process. It may be difficult to complete the play on time and in accordance with the script. The research was published in Science Translational Medicine. Marasso and her colleagues also put this theory to the test by genetically engineering mice to have more of those factors, known as directors, in their regular skin tissue, and they found that those mice healed skin wounds substantially quicker than control mice. However, we are unable to genetically modify humans. Instead, Marasso suggests that if we can learn more about who the healing actors are, we might be able to develop more focused strategies to send those people on stage, to produce a better performance for patients. When physicists attempted to explain the huge particles, they discovered that if they just tried to inject the math into the mathematics equations in the most straightforward way possible, that is, by simply inserting a parameter for the massive particles into the math, the math did not work. It resulted in quantum mechanically incorrect characteristics, indicating that a more sophisticated approach of incorporating mass into the equations is required. That would preserve the basic symmetries while also allowing the particles to have varied masses. After all, the concept is that all particles start off massless. It has a high degree of symmetry since all of the particles have the same math, which is zero. How can you incorporate math without jeopardizing the symmetry required for the equations to make sense? The Higgs field does this by drowning everything in a molasses-like bath, and it turns out that the equations enable you to have your cake and eat it as well. The basic symmetries are well preserved, but the way the particles move in response to different resistances, such as drag, permits them to have varying masses. When physicists attempted to explain the huge particles, they discovered that if they just tried to inject the math into the mathematics equations in the most straightforward way possible, that is, by simply inserting a parameter for the massive particles into the math, the math did not work. It resulted in quantum mechanically incorrect characteristics, indicating that a more sophisticated approach of incorporating mass into the equations is required. 
That would preserve the basic symmetries while also allowing the particles to have varied masses. After all, the concept is that all particles start off massless. It has a high degree of symmetry since all of the particles have the same math, which is zero. How can you incorporate math without jeopardizing the symmetry required for the equations to make sense? The Higgs field does this by drowning everything in a molasses like bath, and it turns out that the equations enable you to have your cake and eat it as well. The basic symmetries are well preserved, but the way the particles move in response to different resistances, such as drag, permits them to have varying masses. As early as 8000 BCE, Neolithic farmers in the Fertile Crescent began manufacturing cheese, a tradition that dates back to before the dawn of recorded human history. For centuries, farmers gathered milk from sheep and goats that had been tamed. However, after a few hours in heated temperatures, that fresh milk started to sour. Proteins coagulated and formed soft clumps as a result of its lactic acid content. Whey, which was subsequently termed after the liquid, was drained from the milk and the farmers discovered that the yellowish globs could be eaten fresh as an easy to spread spread. When these curd-like masses were formed, they could be squeezed, matured, and whirled into any number of different kinds of cheese. The discovery of cheese was a life-saving discovery for the Neolithic people. The proteins, lipids, and minerals found in milk were particularly plentiful. But it also included a lot of lactose, a sugar that many ancient and modern stomachs have a hard time digesting. Cheese, on the other hand, may offer all the benefits of milk while containing far less lactose. These vital nutrients, which could be conserved and stored, may be consumed during times of scarcity and lengthy winters. As early as 8000 BCE, Neolithic farmers in the Fertile Crescent began manufacturing cheese, a tradition that dates back to before the dawn of recorded human history. For centuries, farmers gathered milk from sheep and goats that had been tamed. However, after a few hours in heated temperatures, that fresh milk started to sour. Proteins coagulated and formed soft clumps as a result of its lactic acid content. Whey, which was subsequently termed after the liquid, was drained from the milk and the farmers discovered that the yellowish globs could be eaten fresh as an easy to spread spread. When these curd-like masses were formed, they could be squeezed, matured, and whirled into any number of different kinds of cheese. The discovery of cheese was a life-saving discovery for the Neolithic people. The proteins, lipids, and minerals found in milk were particularly plentiful. But it also included a lot of lactose, a sugar that many ancient and modern stomachs have a hard time digesting. Cheese, on the other hand, may offer all the benefits of milk while containing far less lactose. These vital nutrients, which could be conserved and stored, may be consumed during times of scarcity and lengthy winters. What I'd want to look at today is how much technology, if, well, a pen can be considered technology, perhaps I should say the instrument of writing, influences a writer's style and output. Other aspects that may influence writing style, such as personality, educational background, and so on, should also be considered. Production levels are now easier to track in connection to the type of writing tool utilized. The quill pen, for example, required constant refilling and resharpening, resulting in a slow, balanced literary style with plain phrases. Writing took a lot longer back then than it does now, and the great novelists of the 18th century, Fielding, Smollett, and Richardson, had a tiny output, despite the fact that some of their works were massive. The fountain pen was invented in the middle of the 19th century. It didn't need to be refilled as frequently, which explains Dickens and Thackeray's more flowing, discursive style, as well as their massive production. Then there was the typewriter, which was popular among journalists since it allowed them to speed up the writing process once they got the hang of it. This, it appears to me, resulted in a short-winded style with short phrases. 
If you choose, you may write in a short prose style. As one novelist put it, dictating machines and tape recorders caused writers to become overly chatty, meandering, and long-winded. Despite the fact that he did not utilize these machines, Henry James dictated his later books, and some would agree with this claim. So, it appears that we'll have to postpone our discussion of word processes, computers, and, of course, how film and its storytelling strategies have influenced writing style to another day. What I'd want to look at today is how much technology, if, well, a pen can be considered technology, perhaps I should say the instrument of writing, influences a writer's style and output. Other aspects that may influence writing style, such as personality, educational background, and so on, should also be considered. Production levels are now easier to track in connection to the type of writing tool utilized. The quill pen, for example, required constant refilling and resharpening, resulting in a slow, balanced literary style with plain phrases. Writing took a lot longer back then than it does now, and the great novelists of the 18th century, Fielding, Smollett, and Richardson, had a tiny output, despite the fact that some of their works were massive. The fountain pen was invented in the middle of the 19th century. It didn't need to be refilled as frequently, which explains Dickens and Thackeray's more flowing, discursive style, as well as their massive production. Then there was the typewriter, which was popular among journalists since it allowed them to speed up the writing process once they got the hang of it. This, it appears to me, resulted in a short-winded style with short phrases. If you choose, you may write in a short prose style. As one novelist put it, dictating machines and tape recorders caused writers to become overly chatty, meandering, and long-winded. Despite the fact that he did not utilize these machines, Henry James dictated his later books, and some would agree with this claim. So, it appears that we'll have to postpone our discussion of word processes, computers, and, of course, how film and its storytelling strategies have influenced writing style to another day. Today, I'd want to look at some study on what drives individuals, and in particular, what is known as the mindset, or, to put it another way, the mental attitude that highly driven people have. And, of course, the attitude of those who aren't as motivated as they once were or who have lost their motivation. Motivation is obviously important for performance, but that doesn't tell us where it originates from. Why do some individuals work hard and succeed while others might work just as hard and fail? Why are some people devoted to their job while others aren't? Finding solutions to this issue would be highly beneficial to educators as well as other people in many fields. Businesses, for example, have long assumed that financial incentives such as bonuses, benefits, and salary raises are the most effective motivators. While this is true to some extent, what we call the mental attitude is more significant. It's been tough to figure out what motivates people since drive and the ability to work hard might be misconstrued for skill, as if it's a gift. Either you have it or you don't. People who think this have a stuck mindset and will not only perform below their potential, but their attitude will also affect their entire outlook on life. Some argue that if talent is something that people are born with and you're unlucky enough not to have it, then putting in all that additional effort for no meaningful payoff is pointless. However, studies have proven that putting in the hours leads to the same amount of success as skill. It's a matter of shifting from a fixed mindset to a development mindset, which involves viewing mistakes and failures as opportunities to progress.
Today, I'd want to look at some study on what drives individuals, and in particular, what is known as the mindset, or, to put it another way, the mental attitude that highly driven people have. And, of course, the attitude of those who aren't as motivated as they once were or who have lost their motivation. Motivation is obviously important for performance, but that doesn't tell us where it originates from. Why do some individuals work hard and succeed while others might work just as hard and fail? Why are some people devoted to their job while others aren't? Finding solutions to this issue would be highly beneficial to educators as well as other people in many fields. Businesses, for example, have long assumed that financial incentives such as bonuses, benefits, and salary raises are the most effective motivators. While this is true to some extent, what we call the mental attitude is more significant. It's been tough to figure out what motivates people since drive and the ability to work hard might be misconstrued for skill, as if it's a gift. Either you have it or you don't. People who think this have a stuck mindset and will not only perform below their potential, but their attitude will also affect their entire outlook on life. Some argue that if talent is something that people are born with and you're unlucky enough not to have it, then putting in all that additional effort for no meaningful payoff is pointless. However, studies have proven that putting in the hours leads to the same amount of success as skill. It's a matter of shifting from a fixed mindset to a development mindset, which involves viewing mistakes and failures as opportunities to progress.